It is now Friday, June 22nd. This is your 28storms.com and Hurricane Tracker app update. And we are one day closer to seeing Tropical Storm Debbie in the Gulf of Mexico. The Hurricane Hunter flight that was scheduled to fly into the disturbance this afternoon has been canceled because there is still no primary surface circulation. We do have another mission that is scheduled for tomorrow afternoon and I feel fairly confident that that one will take place. The Hurricane Center is still giving this feature a 70% chance of development within the next 48 hours and I am very confident that we will be dealing with Tropical Storm Debbie probably as early as the latter half of this weekend. Now, as we take a more in-depth analysis of this visible animation, you can still see the very broad cyclonic envelope and we still have multiple smaller vortices swirling about it. However, the primary circulation looks like it's going to develop just to the north of Cancun. This is where the convection has been most persistent, near and just to the east and southeast of this developing low. And this is also where the greatest concentration of low-level 850 millibar vorticity is located. Now, the low-level vorticity is also stretched out, as you can see, across the entire central and southern Gulf of Mexico. But we are starting to see a little bit better concentration here, just to the north of the Yucatan. And although the convection has been periodic at best, with each and every pulse of convection that is helping to enhance the low-level vorticity, so very steadily, day by day, this storm is getting itself better organized. And although upper-level winds are only marginal at best for development at this time, they are becoming more favorable. We still see the westerly vertical wind shear across the central and northern Gulf of Mexico, but over into the western Caribbean, you can start to see the outflow channels beginning to develop so the southern and eastern peripheries of the disturbance are looking much healthier compared to 24 and 48 hours ago and I would be willing to bet that we will still see a little bit of improvement here along the northern semicircle as we go into Sunday. The upper level streamline analysis shows that the central area of the upper level ridging is out over the Bay of Campeche so it's not vertically stacked 100% over the disturbance just yet and that is why we still have that marginal wind shear but even on the shear tendency maps, you can see by the blue dotted lines, the shear is beginning to decrease out across the central gulf. Heavy rainfall will continue to be an issue throughout the forecast period for the Florida Peninsula as the surface low continues to move north through Sunday. And you can see that the squalls are even starting to make it into coastal Louisiana, including Plaquemines Parish. This will be a continuing trend over the next two to three days. But for interest along coastal Alabama and the northwest section of the Florida Panhandle, the rainfall chances from the National Weather Service are a bit lower throughout the forecast period. That is a result of more dry air in the mid to upper levels of the atmosphere as we are dealing with that mid to upper level trough over the eastern United States. But this is still subject to change depending on what our Gulf system decides to do later on in the upcoming week. Coastal flood advisories remain in effect for all of southeast Louisiana. And if the storm decides to move closer toward the coast, as what we are currently thinking, and then especially if it takes that westerly turn toward Texas, right underneath the state, then I do expect that these advisories will be extended toward the west. As the disturbance becomes quasi-stationary across the central Gulf of Mexico Sunday and into Monday, we are anticipating some very extreme rainfall totals over the open waters. The HPC is forecasting in excess of 17 inches, over the next five days, which is fine because as of right now, as you can see, it's well away from any coastal communities, but if the low does deviate and track a little, this will be something to consider. Now, unfortunately, the spaghetti model plots, like the one that we are currently looking at, are still getting the most publicity, and what's unfortunate about this is that they oftentimes display some of the worst models that we have. Even the H-Wharf and the GFDL which are two models that have been toted to be the next best thing in hurricane forecasting over the last few years, have been wildly inconsistent. And there are several other types of models that are out there that you just never see get displayed on maps like this. So if you look at this particular map today, you would think that the overwhelming model consensus is straight toward Florida and that the forecast is pretty much a done deal with the storm going straight toward the northeast and that's about it. But the truth is we have a whole other set of models, probably half or two-thirds of the more, the more reliable ones are taking it toward Mexico and Texas. So just please keep this in mind whenever you see this get thrown up on TV really quickly. Also one final thing to note about these tropical models is their intensity forecasts. Now 
you've got to keep in mind that if you look at this plot, a lot of the models that you see here are the same models that are taking the storm toward Florida. And as a meteorologist, if you decide that the storm is not going to go to Florida, then you must be saying that it's moving in a different direction and into completely different atmospheric conditions. So if you don't believe in their model tracks, then you certainly cannot believe in the intensity forecast. So with all that finally being over, we're going to switch over to the latest dynamical run from the ECMWF. This is the low-level vorticity map combined with sea level pressure, and as we saw from the vorticity charts and the visible satellite animation, it looks as though it's correctly initializing the best vort max just to the north of Cancun, Mexico, and into 24 and 48 hours, it takes it straight toward the north while showing further development into Tropical Storm Devi, and then it remains nearly stationary for 48 to 72 hours, but as we go into days 4 and 5, the storm is making a beeline straight toward Brownsville, Texas, and the lowest central pressure is down to 993 millibars, and if the storm does take this westerly track, that will give it the best chance of becoming a hurricane, and this makes perfect sense because usually once storms become trapped underneath mid to upper level ridges over the central plains, the conditions in the Gulf of Mexico are usually favorable. At this time, we are still observing the ECMWF products, but now this is the mid-levels of the atmosphere at 500 millibars. This gives us a good feel as to what the strength of the central United States ridge and the eastern United States trough will be like. And into 48 and 72 hours, this is when the storm nearly stalls out. The ridge is still trying to build out across Oklahoma and Kansas, while the first initial trough is swinging out of the eastern United States and into the Maritimes of Canada. But by days four, and day five, even though the storm is starting to turn toward the west, the trough is amplifying here. And yes, we are not ruling out a more northeasterly track. And every so often, those tropical models can get it right. So interest across Florida, please keep this in mind. But at the same time, we need to pay attention to some of the more accurate models here. And the European is still obviously showing the ridge catching the storm. And so therefore, Texas and potentially even northern Mexico would be under the gun in such a scenario. Now we are going to next up take a look at the Canadian CMC forecast and while the CMC is a dynamical model it is not the best tropical model. Nevertheless though we do see some agreement between the European and what this model member is showing. It's taking the storm up toward the north before a turn toward the west and finally by day six we're looking at a landfall somewhere between Corpus Christi and Galveston, Texas. Also, if we turn to the CMC shear forecast, it shows the ridge moving into the central gulf, and then it expands through the forecast period throughout the Gulf of Mexico. So this would be a favorable pattern for development all the way up until the storm moves inland. Also, while we're on the topic of shear forecast, this is what the European model is showing. Initially, we have the strong westerly shear, and that is correct. But fast forward to 48 hours, and this year is forecast to lift northward, leaving favorable conditions in the Gulf of Mexico. Moving forward into day four, there is a lot of shear, but it's over the Gulf Coast states, and as long as it stays just to the north of the cyclone, this would actually be a favorable setup, and the same could be said through day five. Lastly, this is a look at the GFS operational model, and the GFS is easily one of the better models, but it does have its weaknesses, just like any other forecast guidance that we have. And through 24 and 48 hours, it is in general agreement with the CMC and GFS by taking the low slowly toward the north, but then as we go into 48 and 72 hours, it looks as though too many spokes of convection are forecast to develop on the northeast quadrant of the storm. And although a northeast track toward Florida is still a legit possibility, it looks as though the common problem with the GFS, that being convective feedback, is altering the forecast of the cyclone in this model too much and with new pockets of low pressure developing over the Florida Peninsula from that convection it's going to help draw at the primary low toward the Sunshine State and therefore more prone to getting pulled up by the eastern United States trough. And in terms of the GFS ensemble members the operational run does have support from a few of those ensembles but as you can see it looks as though the two-thirds majority is actually out across Louisiana but especially so across the state of Texas. So just to recap, the Florida Peninsula will be receiving the heaviest rainfall over the next several days. The central Gulf Coast will have the highest risk of rip currents along with coastal flooding due to constant onshore southerly winds. But overall, in terms of the best landfall probabilities, that still belongs to Texas. But this is an evolving situation. As you can see, it is very complex. 
this is just more so of a heads up and more of a thorough analysis that you don't get to see so much on television and that is what we try to bring to you here at 28storms.com but in terms of overall preparation anyone along the entire Gulf Coast still is advised to prepare in the event that the forecast does change so thanks for tuning in spread the word come back to 28storms.com and also check us out with our videos available at the hurricane tracker app available at the Apple Store